that I was a product of a mixed marriage, and I think that gave me different values. My father was definitely born and raised in Stevens Point, but my mother was from Minnesota. So it gave me a weird accent, and I, I think Stevens Point, I think of it as being this, the best place in the world to grow up, because I did, I grew up here. My mother was a reader, and even though she didn't finish high school, she would take me to the public library. I was always reading these interesting uh, romances by uh, writers from the 30s, like Emily Loring, you know, the smart girl, whatever. They were always spunky girls, and uh, that's what I wanted to be, a spunky girl. And when I got to college, I was in pre-law. That's right, pre-law, but I thought, I, don't, I didn't want it to be a career about fighting as a woman for my place in a male-dominated world. And I went to, I had to take a, some kind of, you know, acting class, uh, some kind of fine arts type thing. And I ended up working in the, that little black box theater and soldering things and doing all this technical stuff. The image of Kathy Kinney in college was overalls. That's all you ever thought. She was always, and she knew how to run the light board, hang lights, do gobos. I mean, she was a tech whiz man. And I, I love creating things with my hands, and that's, that's how it started. And then I applied for a work-study job in the scene shop. And then finally, uh, one summer, Tony Schmidt, who just passed away this last year, a wonderful, wonderful teacher. I was mad at my roommate. I was so angry. And he cast me as this angry older woman in The Boyfriend. And I still remember that play, Kathy's first play, where she was dressed. It was a period play. She had something like one of those from the 1920s kind of fur things that went down to like in a hat with this long feather in it. <laughs> and she'd always do a thing where intentionally would be putting it in someone's face when she'd turn her head. That was, that was it. That was my showbiz breakthrough. And half the time I didn't know what was going on and people were laughing and I just thought, oh, isn't that they're enjoying this or that. Like I never knew they were laughing at me. I went from Stevens Point to New York City. And there were some, some alumni there that I kind of knew, and we all became friends because you truly, that Wisconsin thing. So we all became, it was a theater crowd. And I made her take an improv class because I wanted to take it, and it was in a part of New York City that wasn't too great at night, and I didn't want to go alone. It was absolutely crystal clear to everyone except Kathy that she was gonna be a comedian as a profession. I mean, she was hilarious. We couldn't finish our sketches. We couldn't stop laughing. We couldn't care, you know, we, we had to learn to work with Kathy because she was so bright and shiny and funny. The next thing I knew, they asked me to be in a group and I did it. And I remember the first time on stage, this feeling of wholeness, of, this is the way you're supposed to feel. And I never looked back. And people, it just kept happening. I shot a movie called Parting Glances in uh, New York. And then, you know, if you're popular in New York, you can be popular in LA. And I think the first thing I did was the New Heart Show, where I was the slutty town librarian, you know. And it was just, it was thrilling to work with Bob Newhart and Tom Poston. I love those men. I learned so much from them. The Drew Carey Show started, and there was two other women uh, who were supposed to play Mimi. My agent called me up and he said, it's um, the role of someone who's selling cosmetics. And I pick up the script and it actually said, the meanest, ugliest woman in the world, all wrong to sell cosmetics. I did the whole part, and I was, and I was right in that casting director's face, and I go, you know, and if you don't uh, give me the job, you're gonna see my lawyer. I'm gonna be back. And then I got up and I walked right out of the room and I slammed the door and I left. And I, I didn't know that for like six hours they were looking for me and uh, to tell me that I had to be at work the next morning. It was uh, a journey, an adventure, an amazing adventure that 
even though I'm older now, is not over. There's always something more. And I, I, I did a lot of things, and I did Mrs. P, which was the most, you know, the children's character was the most fulfilling, and still the most fulfilling. I wrote a whole new pilot for Mrs. P, and it sort of starts with, this line came into my head one day. It was, uh, Miranda hated her name, her little brother, and her life in that order. I create every day. I am addicted to Adobe Photoshop. If you need your passport altered, call me, because I, I just, I love it. I'd say to her, can we write a book? I mean, I, I've published books, but can we write a book? Do we have the skills? And she said, well, why not? Why not? So we wrote this book, Queen of Your Own Life, The Grown-Up Woman's Guide to Claiming Happiness and Getting the Life You Deserve, which the title was the choice of the editor. But, but we wrote it, and by that time, the reason that I wanted to write it was because I'd really found out that there's so many women who believe that the grass is greener on the other side. So I wanted to write this book to show that we are all more alike than different. People always ask me, well, you know, how did this happen? How did you become this or how did you become that? And, you know, I simply put one foot in front of the other. And I was terrified, but I was more terrified to stop than I was to just keep walking forward. And that's how that thing where you go, well, the two places I said I would never live were New York City, I lived there for 10 years, and Los Angeles, and I've been there for 30 years now. I've always said eight billion times on tape or anywhere that you can take the girl out of Wisconsin, but you cannot take Wisconsin out of the girl. And I will always think of this as home and uh, always think of Wisconsin as my state. <laughs>